We'll intervene whenever we decide it's in our national security interest to intervene. And if you don't like it, lump it. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Welcome to the darkened hour. Welcome to another episode of the darkened hour. I'm your host, Adam Fitzgerald. With me today is a very special guest, retired Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson. Lawrence Wilkerson is a retired U.S. Army Colonel and former Chief of Staff to United States Secretary of Defense, uh, United States Secretary of State Colin Powell. He also served as the Associate Director under the Director of Policy Planning. He was also a veteran of the Vietnam War, as well as having served in Korea, Japan, and Hawaii, while also having worked as a distinguished adjunct professor of government and public policy at the College of William and Mary since 2006, and taught national security affairs at the Honors Program at George Washington University. He is also the winner of the Sam Adams Award in 2009, which is given annually to an intelligent professional who has taken a stand for integrity and ethics, as he is an outspoken critic of U.S.-Israeli foreign policy, as well as the Iraq War in Guantanamo. In 2014, the book, War is Not About Truth, Justice, and American Way, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson on the Real News, which are a collection of interviews between himself and CEO of Real News, Paul Jay. Thank you very much for coming on, Mr. Wilkerson. It's good to be with you, Adam. Um, well, I'll start off very simply. Um, let's start from the beginning. How can you, can you give us a general description of your military career? Oh, wow. <laughs> 31 years spend a lot of, a lot of time and a lot of, uh, foreign policy troubles, et cetera. I came in in 1966 and as, as an enlisted man, mm. um, volunteered for the infantry, airborne ranger. Of course, you never volunteer for anything. But in this case, I, I didn't get any of it. I was told, wow, you're smart. You need to go to officer candidate school. <laughs> so I went to OCS, was commissioned as a second lieutenant. And then they said, no, you're not going to Vietnam. I'd originally enlisted to go to Vietnam. Um, you're not going yet. We're going to send you to flight school. So they sent me to flight school and I became a helicopter pilot. Then I got to Vietnam, uh, served a tour there, uh, and then uh, started what would probably be called a, a rather fast rise up the ranks into the ether of uh, power politics within the U.S. military. And I spent my last 12 years um, essentially serving Colin Powell as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, working with all four of the now five, six, if you count the Space Force, Armed Services, and working uh, at, the, at the highest level of the military. And then, of course, worked for him personally for a couple of years and then became a uh, member of his policy planning staff when he was nominated to Secretary of State and then as Chief of Staff in August of 2002. So pretty, yeah. uh, pretty yeah, fast very, summary. <laughs> sure, it's a, it's because it's such an extensive career you had in the military. But in 1989, you became the assistant to Colin Powell, who at this time became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff through the Gulf War. Um, what, how did you get this position? Well, he told me uh, when I interviewed with him in January of 1989, uh, I was a professor at the Naval War College at that time. He said, uh, you come highly recommended. I don't know whether I'm going to hire you. There are 12 other officers. Do you want the job? And I said, no. He said, why? I said, because I'm very happy where I am. He said, well, that that recommends you. And that, that was the end of the interview. It had gone on for about an hour, um, included such wonderful questions as, could you write me a speech for a black Baptist church? And I said, well, I'm not sure, but I'd give it a try. He laughed and he said, don't worry, I'll write that one myself. <laughs> but at the end of that interview, I thought, mm, went back, told my Navy Admiral boss, um, hey, 
Admiral, I'm not going to get that job, so don't worry about me leaving anytime soon. A month later, Admiral called me down to his office and said, you have a call from the National Security Advisor to Ronald Reagan. Oh, that was Powell, Powell of course, yeah. at the time. And he said, get your butt down here. I'm going to take over the uh, Army Forces Command in Atlanta. Um, we com he, he then commanded all the, mil all the Army Forces, active reserve and National Guard in the continental United States and in the territories. Um, I went and joined him and uh, hardly got a chance to sit down because he was selected, of course, sure. by H.W. Bush to be his chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. What was your view of American foreign policy at this time? Was it uh, uh, far different than what you view it now? It was, but it was growing. It was growing exponentially. I fault myself for being a typical Army soldier and following what my country said and did and trying not to be too much of an objector. Um, but I had grown rather, I, I'd grown rather obstreperous in the ranks, if you will, in terms of the Vietnam War, in terms of the all-volunteer force. I thought that was a tremendous mistake to take the citizen soldier out of the equation. Um, and so I, I, I was becoming a little bit different, if you will, with my view of, a, of the empire's policy. And I knew damn well we were an empire at this early time. The question was, what kind of empire were we? Hmm. Well, I went to the Naval War College as a student and learned quite a bit about policy and strategy and then served in the Pacific with uh, Admiral Bill Crow, who would be the chairman before Powell and his uh, right-hand man, Admiral Stu Ring. And I learned even more about power management at that level. And by the time I joined Powell, I was a pretty uh, questioning individual about U.S. security policy, foreign policy, and so forth. Ask Colin, he'll tell you that. <laughs> sure. You know, right about the same time between, I'd say, the Reagan and Bush administrations, uh, more prominent under Bush, uh, you started seeing elements of this ultra-nationalist movement, which would be a prominent force influencing U.S. foreign politics, and they would be called the neoconservatives. Who were they, and why were they such a driving force in American politics uh, in the Middle East during the latter part of the 20th century? Well, I teach this. I, I teach principally World War II forward from about 1947 in the National Security Act, July 1947 forward. Uh, it's, I'm not ignorant of the rest of American history, but I know that period pretty well. So mm -hmm. my first remark to your question is they aren't new. They've been with us for a long time. Mm. Uh, you can go back and look at uh, Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, look at uh, Tyler and Polk and others. Um, very much of the same sort of ilk in terms of security and foreign policy. That is to say, uh, we have some kind of mandate in the world. Uh, the war with Mexico was probably, as Grant himself said, probably one of the worst examples of aggressive war, a grand uh, territorial aggrandizement in the history of warfare. He was right. Grant was absolutely right. This isn't a new strain. It really takes off, though, with the 1947 National Security Act and NSC 68, which was an almost religious document done by Truman's NSC. I'm not sure Truman cared for it much, but his NSC did it. And that document with religious fervor said how we had to fight the Soviets that we had to do anything, that we had to go on the dark side, if you will. Yeah. We had to match them poison for poison, insidiousness for insidiousness. Well, this is exactly what I heard later with the neoconservatives under Dick Cheney and others in the early 2000s. They would do anything, absolutely anything. And when they tell you that, it's you, you suspect their patriotism. Now, some of them are ultimate patriots. They just have this jaundiced view of what patriotism means. Sure. But many of them are corrupt to the hilt. They're making huge amounts of money off the complex that we created during the Cold War. We now call it the military industrial complex, but it's much bigger than that. It's universities, it's think tanks, it's lobby groups, it's Congress, because Congress gets its political coffers filled by companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Grumman. So it's much wider writ even than Eisenhower predicted in his farewell address in 1961. Um, so that's what's happened to the empire. The empire has become polluted mm 
with uh, 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 its desire to maintain the status quo, to not slip at all, to be the hegemon of the world. And these people have taken advantage of that now. They were unable to do it totally during the Cold War because we had some fairly good leadership. We had some good experienced presidents, the most prominent of which of course was Dwight Eisenhower. And he kept some of these people at bay. Even Kennedy kept them at bay as inexperienced at that level of power management as he was, he kept them at bay. One could say he kept them at bay to his own death. Um, and, and then there are others, but we have had a series of presidents since roughly George H.W. Bush left, the last president with the, you might say, the experience of an Eisenhower. Um, and those presidents have been grossly inexperienced. And as a consequence, these people have taken off almost like a jet plane. And they have become a major force in American politics. And even more dangerously, they've, they've become a major force in maintaining the American empire and its imperial writ around the world because they benefit greatly from that empire. If there's a deep state, then these people constitute an integral part of that deep state. And they're everything from Charles Koch and his Koch Institute all the way over to the other side, the uh, people in America who are allied so zealously with the relig religious Zionist in Israel, most yeah. notably recently, Bibi Netanyahu. Would uh, you know just to touch a little bit on this uh, about the historicity of the neoconservative? Would would the primary influences be someone like um, Leo Strauss and Paul Nitschke? Oh yes, Th these are people that are um, uh, even if they haven't read them. <laughs> they echo their thoughts vividly. Right. <laughs> yes, very much so. Because uh, Nitschke himself uh, was a co-founder of Team B, which was an intelligence think tank that challenged the uh, national intelligence assessments provided by the CIA. Um, in, in you touch on Benjamin Netanyahu, and this is somebody who's going to be very important in terms of foreign policy. And it's, this is a two-part question. In 1996, Netanyahu was appointed prime minister of Israel. Um, how much of a polarizing influence was he in Congress and continued to be over the years? And has been the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee been the poignant driving factor behind the neoconservative movement in shaping U.S. Middle East foreign policy? Yes, yes, and yes, <laughs> to a certain extent, at least. Right. Um, let's take my administration, for example. There were people in my administration, Richard Cheney being one of them, who I wouldn't call a neoconservative in the pure sense of that term. I'd right. call him a hyper-nationalist. And what I mean by that is it's America first, second, third, and fourth, and be damned to everybody else. If I think anybody in the world is a threat to America, I'm going to smash you. Mm -hmm. That's Dick Cheney. Mm -hmm. But that fit well into those neoconservatives around him, Paul Wolfowitz, Douglas Fife, and a host of others, Richard Burrell on the outside. That fit very much into their game plan. Um, they all wanted to royal the Middle East. They wanted to rip the Middle East from one end to the other, mm -hmm. get the Arabs fighting amongst themselves, get the Persians and the Arabs fighting against one another, all to protect Israel because they thought if these people were in turmoil, and it didn't matter to them if it were perpetual turmoil, then Israel would be safe. So that was part of the motivation for the 2003 invasion of Iraq, and the neoconservatives in that sense led that. Um, but there's, there's a wider writ today for them, too, than just the Levant, just the Middle East. I think they feed naturally into and have fed naturally into the movement that Donald Trump, however imperfectly, came to personify. And that's this supranationalist movement that yes. ultimately yes. looks a lot like 1933, 34, 35 right. in Germany. It looks a lot like Hitler. It looks a lot like fascism. And it looks a lot like a much, much moneyed, paid for, supported um, effort to consolidate power for a number of different reasons. But most of the reasons boil down to, I think we'd be a, be a better country if we were white, male, if we had to, if we had to admit it. Right. And we would be uh, mostly of our ilk, our kin and our people read uh, corporate giants that make tons of money, monopolize predatory crony capitalism, sell shitty products, and yet vouchsafe themselves to the world as the world's finest economy. Right. And have created 
incidentally, the greatest maldistribution of wealth amongst 330 million Americans that we've had in our history, even worse than 1929. Uh, is APEC still a major influence today? Absolutely, but they got beaten for the first time. They were probably the most influential foreign agency operating in the United States, behind only maybe the NRA for specific issues, and maybe what's the, I, I always forget it, the uh, old people, my people, the lobby <laughs> for the old people. <laughs> Maybe, maybe only behind them in terms of overall power, but they got beaten on the JCPOA. They were beaten badly. And part of that was J Street, the alternative right. to APAC now. Part of it was a lot of young Jewish Americans who got disgusted with Israel and are still disgusted with Israel. And part of it was older Jewish Americans who don't like Netanyahu at all and fear he's imperiling them and their status in the United States by his Zionist uh, attitudes and policies. So APAC has fallen off in terms of its influence. It's not quite the power that it was before. What is your opinion on Yair Lapid, is, uh, the, the new prime minister? I think we've got more of the same, just different packaging. Mm. Uh, and I think we've got a realization that things had grown so bitter towards Netanyahu, even from his own Jewish yeah. community in America, that they needed a change. And so they sort of rotated the people, if you will. Yes. The, the beliefs and the fundamental policies haven't changed a bit, but, but they put a better face on it. At the, at the same time, how much of a factor were the Saudis in the middle 1990s with Congress? Did they have uh, a great influence in, in politics as well? No question that the Saudis probably next to APAC had the second most influential operation in Washington, much more subdued, much more pub, less public, and, and much, I, I almost want to say clandestine. It operated with Bandar at the head of it. And Prince Bandar, of course, I think his tenure was about a decade as the ambassador in the United States. He was the type of person who would invite me and, and Powell and Rich Armitage, the deputy secretary of state, over to his home for luscious, lascivious meals. Roberta Flack would warble in our ears waltzing between the tables. We'd eat off gold instruments that were probably 24 karat or at least 18 karat. My wife grew so angry one night, she looked at me and said, can we go home? I'm sick of this. I'm sick of this, this opulence. <laughs> and sure. Indeed, we did. We got up and we left because it was just, but this was Bandar. This was the way the Saudis exercised their influence on the elite, on those people who they knew made the decisions especially, and I'm, I'm reluctant to admit this, I think, but I think it's true, on the Bush dynasty, the Bush family. Mm. There was a lot of Saudi influence there, but it spread out all across the Congress, all across key members of the government and so forth. Bandar was one of the best diplomats probably the Saudis ever had in Washington because he got pretty much what he wanted when he wanted it. He sure did. He, he actually had a nickname, Bandar Bush, because he was such a, yep. a close friend of the Bush family. And um, here's the man here's the man who at one point and I've heard more than one person who was in a position to know this said something about when he was accused of a billion dollar bribe with regard to a British uh I forget the name of the company now but it was a a British company that was selling jets to South Africa as I recall mm -hmm. and Bandar got a billion dollars for his role in expediting the deal and he said that was the cost of doing business that was Bandar's. That's sort of, that was Bandar's philosophy. You give me a billion dollars because I did the business for you. Uh, there's so much disconnect between the United States. I can understand why the United States wanted a, a relationship with Israel. I mean, it's that almost this political uh, idea of nationalist ideology that's aligned between Zionists and evangelical Christians. That's not the case with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is such a uh, polarizing. It's such a different aspect in every way possible, but yet the only uh, link between the United States and Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia is oil. Uh, it's such an ideologically there's, backwards. Uh, there's more than that. There's more than that. Could you I explain? Think at, yeah, I think at one time when Roosevelt met with the king and set up the initial deal, if you will, um, I think it was all about oil. And I think it was all about oil through Truman and Eisenhower and others, though Truman really, he really had some problems with the whole business. He, he wouldn't, for example, approve 
the British approached him, but he wouldn't approve the coup against Mossadegh, which happened under Eisenhower. Right, right. Truman said, no, I'm not doing that. And we had worked out an agreement. Uh, the British weren't happy with this, with the Saudis, where we shared 50-50. The British were still taking about 99 and giving one to the Iranians, to whom they all belonged. Yes. Um, so it was, a, it was a different period then. And we really did need that oil, not just for ourselves, but to bring France and Britain and ultimately Japan back from the total destruction almost of World War II. Uh, the Brits were still hanging on by the time we get to Suez in 56. So that was the reason for the coup in Iran. That was the reason for the deals with oil. Lots of other reasons too, of course, people got their hands greased. Mm -hmm. uh, but as time went by and as really only to a certain extent, the Europeans and to a greater extent, the Japanese needed that Persian Gulf oil mm. and we needed it less and less. And today, of course, don't need it at all. Um, things change and they change so fast that the Saudis always very good at this, very good at this, smelling that change shifted a bit. And they began to make it all about personal relationships. And they began to make it all about buying our weaponry mm. at enormous cost to them. But it was just the price of doing business given the staggering amounts of money. You wanna see a maldistribution of wealth, check out Saudi Arabia. <laughs> yes, I, I read somewhere they're the biggest waste of money. And I think Bandar once stated in an interview, I think would meet the press uh, many years ago, where he stated that he believes that there was an estimate of anywhere between eight to ten billion dollars of mismanagement of funds, and uh, I, I mean, in, in just ten years. Yeah, I, I would say it was. I would say it was five times that. But, that's amazing. That's <laughs> but there's so many people, and a lot of them are, are Americans. So many people around picking up those funds, yeah. picking up some here, some there, and so forth. Contractors, people working on the Saudi F-15 fleet people working on the Saudi ballistic missile defense fleet. I mean, it's just enormous. We have more contractors in the Levant now than we do have soldiers, Marines, sailors, or anything else in uniform. Contractors everywhere. DOD cannot tell you on any given day how many contractors it has. That's one reason it can't complete an audit. It does not know how many civilian contractors are working for it, and it does not know how much it is paying out the door of your tax money every day for those contractors. But I will assure you, having been there and watched the money go out the door, it's enormous. It's almost all cost plus contracts. They build crappy products, they deliver crappy service, and they take away maximum money. Their CEO's pay has gone up astronomically in the last 20 years. So that's part of the Saudi relationship is this money. And where does some of that money come back and go? It goes illegally, in most cases, into the coffers of American politicians. So guess how they decide when it comes to Saudi Arabia. Now, I'm over in the Congress. I'm over in the Congress for almost two years, several years ago. And I'm over there lobbying for the United States to get out of the war in Yemen, to stop supporting yeah. the Saudis. Mm. At that point, F-15s, armaments for the F-15s, fuel for the F-15s, intelligence sharing, you name it. I'm wondering why I can't find enough people to vote on the War Powers Act and stop the United States participation because they're never approved by Congress in that war. I finally get a vote. Well, I, I didn't do it single-handedly. We finally get a vote. And it is passed in both houses, but is overturned because Trump vetoes it and there's not enough to override his veto. All that to tell you that in the course of those months of lobbying, I discovered the Democrats are just as bad as the Republicans. I discovered, for example, that if a Pelosi or a Hoyer or a Schumer or a Menendez doesn't want that to pass, they just go ahead and vote for it, knowing full well Trump's going to veto it and there's not going to be enough votes to override the veto. Or, as they did in the beginning of our efforts, they actually steamrolled and tried to let our efforts die inside the House in particular, but the Senate too. So they didn't want to get us out of that war. Well, that caused me to start looking around for why, because this was just bizarre to me. Why in the world do they want to support this vicious, brutal war, which the Saudis started 
which their leader, Mohammed bin Salman, made his personal feat. And he's getting beaten terribly. He's been defeated. He's defeated right now. Um, why were we supporting him in that? Mm. All those reasons I told you about mm. just came right in my ear, my eyes all the time. Mm. People are getting money. They're getting rich. They're getting a fortune out of Saudi Arabia. And some of them, some of the congressmen, senators will tell you, we, we have a jobs that depend on the Saudis buying the billions of dollars worth of equipment and other things that they buy from us every day, training, uh, whole packages of logistics and so forth. It's a hugely remunerative relationship for the military industrial complex. They then turn around and influence their senators and their representatives and it continues. And you're just, you're fighting a, an enormous apparatus of influence when you try to stop something like the brutal killing civilians left and right, men, women, and children, cholera outbreak, no food, naval blockade, which we're sort of backing up. No food can get in. And we're backing this. We're supporting this. It was just unbelievable. I, could, it, I didn't find it credible until I began to see just how much influence the Saudis have on our policymakers. You, you retire from the military in 97. And you began acting as an advisor to Colin Powell. Um, did you start noticing at around this same time the change in foreign policy? And, or was it becoming um, influenced by the neocons of Saudis and Israelis at the same time? There were things happening. Um, when I was working for him in a private capacity, we, we did all sorts of things. Um, we monitored the elections in Nigeria, for example, yeah. when uh, uh, Jimmy Carter went over from the Carter, Carter Center. He was yeah. with Powell and that monitoring team. Um, but it was not apparent to me at that time, and I, I don't think it was apparent to my boss either, uh, Colin Powell, that we had this sort of building of this kind of influence on national security decision making. What was apparent was that we probably had made some real grievous mistakes in the eight years of Bill Clinton, the most prominent of which was becoming the expansion of NATO because we were expanding NATO into the near abroad, if you will, of mm -hmm. first Boris Yeltsin and then Vladimir Putin. That was brought home vividly in the so-called war in Kosovo when we began to bomb the Serbs uh, and uh, in essence, drive Milosevic from his office, all under the auspices of really of humanitarian operations, when in fact, what we were doing was challenging Russia boldly and in her face. Hmm. Um, when my president then later went to Georgia and on the streets of Tbilisi announced to the Georgians in public that they would soon be a member of NATO, what did Putin do? A couple of weeks later, he invaded the northern part of Georgia. So we just made strategic era after strategic era, beginning with Bill Clinton and continuing in the Obama administration. The war in Libya was another example of just a terrible era, a huge strategic era. And then, you know, we we made the biggest strategic era of all in the Bush administration with our invasion of Iraq in 2003, set the Levant afire, which is what the neoconservatives wanted. Right. So they duck in and out of influential positions and they get what they can while they're there. Uh, John Bolton got what he could while he was mm. national security to advisor to Trump. One of the things he got was a retightening of the screws on Cuba, an insane blockade that's been there for half a century. Mm. doesn't make any sense at all, but that's what keeps it there is people like Bolton and people like those who started the war in Iraq in 2003. And uh, it's ruinous for American foreign policy, but they see it as very positive for their goals. So in, in 19, also, just to touch on 97, uh, a neoconservative think tank project for New American Century was shaped by Bill Kristol, Dick Cheney, Robert Kagan. And in just four months, uh, they tried to ardently pressure uh, then President Clinton in January of 98 to authorize the U.S. military invasion of Iraq. Um, why was there no pushback against this militaristic sect within the federal government, or were they that powerful? I think there was pushback, and I, uh, you know, I, I would go back to George H. W. Bush, hmm. who got 
in 1992, as I recall, a new national security strategy for the United States that was written by essentially my guess, it looked like his pen, Paul Wolfowitz, who was then under Secretary of Defense for Policy. He'd later be Deputy Secretary of Defense for George W. Bush. What H.W. Bush said about it, and I don't think this is apocryphal, he handed it to one of his assistants and said, send this back to the crazies in the basement of the Pentagon. <laughs> now, this is a sober, experienced president, regardless of what you think of his policies. He was serious, sober, and he was experienced. Director of the CIA, vice president for eight years under Ronald Reagan, He'd been ambassador to, or equivalent to ambassador to China. He'd been head of the uh, uh, RNC, the Republican National Committee. This is a guy who'd been around. Uh, as a 17, 18 year old Navy pilot, he had to ditch in the Pacific after being shot down. So this is a guy who'd been around. And he said, send it back to the crazies in the basement of the Pentagon. What George W. Bush then said, his son was, I like this. So that became, that, that became really positive influence on the national security decision-making process. And in essence, it became the 2002 national security strategy of the United States under Bush. So they hung around these Bill Crystal types, this project for a new American history, history uh, new American century plan hung around until it found an advantageous target. And that advantageous target was inexperienced president, probably the most inexperienced in the history, post-World War II history of our country, and, and a vice president who was a hyper-nationalist and really running the White House for national security. They found that combination and they said, yippee, and they went to work. Would, would, would it be fair, would it be too outside the fringes to say that the influence or some elements uh, which helped to create the um, Project for New American Century came from, um, say, the Oded Yunnan Plan of 1982? I don't think, you know, I'm not that familiar with it. Uh, I would say that, as I've said before, these people have been around for a long time, sure. but I don't think that they had the fundamental attachment to Israel that they have now and that they had then. And that above all other aspects, and there are many other aspects to it. I mean, there are people who want to do the sorts of things that we did because they feel like that's America's mission in the world. Uh, I call them uh, missionaries for, for power, missionaries for the empire. Mm. And they range the gamut from someone like Samantha Power, who's now in the new administration, mm. was uh, in Obama's administration. Remind me to tell you a story about what Obama said to me about that. Uh, and all the way over from these humanitarian, almost messianic people want to bring democracy to everyone, even at the point of a bayonet, um, over here to the people who are pure realists, like Dick Cheney, although, as I said, I wouldn't call him a neoconservative. But people like Fife and Wolfowitz, they are fundamentally realists. They just have that neoconservative tinge to the realism. And they find allies everywhere, and they exploit them. Mm -hmm. um, wherever and whenever they can. So you get this combination of people who've grown up in the Cold War. As I said, it even precedes the World War II, but it really takes off with the Cold War because you've got this permanent enemy and you've got to stay on top or the permanent enemy is going to undermine you. And that atmosphere and that culture builds this whole complex that they then find very ready for their machinations when they want to do things. They haven't gone away either. They're still there. Right. And whenever they find a vulnerability, whenever they find particularly a White House vulnerability or a congressional vulnerability, they move into it and they exploit it and they use it to the maximum extent possible to accomplish the things that they want to accomplish. Watch what's going to happen now as Israel turns into an apartheid state full blown, which is where she's headed. She cannot be a democracy and a Jewish state. She's either got to be one or the other. And if she's going to be a Jewish state, then the Palestinians and other Arabs within her borders, and certainly those around in the occupied territories and other places, will remain fourth and fifth class citizens. That's apartheid. 
and, and they are going to become an apartheid state just as surely as South Africa did. Well, what happens to them then? They're going to need these people to come out of the woodwork and be almost everything that influences decision making in the United States in order to survive. Because I don't think Israel can survive without the umbilical cord to Washington. And, and, and that's going to be a very hard thing for both of us to negotiate and may wind up damaging both of us and may damage Israel to the point where she doesn't exist anymore. I, I think they've created, these neoconservatives have created not a sound and, and, and stable situation for Israel. I think they've created a nightmare for Israel. And she's going to have a very hard time surviving the next quarter century. Let's not lose on the previous thought about Samantha Power. Um, tell us about that story and who is Samantha Power for our listeners? Well, Samantha Power wrote uh, Chasing the Flame uh, about Sergio Vieira de Malio really a great diplomat and a good book. But Samantha came into the Obama administration on the NSC as sort of the manager of humanitarian operations. Um, in that capacity, I think she had a great, fast forward, I think she had a great deal to do with the, uh, she and Hillary Clinton and Susan Rice had a great deal to do with Obama's, who was very reluctant, very reluctant, commitment of forces in Libya, a disaster, a mm. strategic mm. disaster. So he ships her off to the UN, <laughs> at least I think he did for that reason. And he says, oh, well, you go up to the UN and be our ambassador up there. And I think he went, get her out of my hair. She's sure. no longer on the NSC. Um, well, up there, she still talked about the things that she was accustomed to talking about. So when I went, met with him in November of 2015 in the Roosevelt Room, he and John Kerry, uh, he gave me and General Paul Egan, who was with me, a 45 minute disquisition on his feelings. <laughs> and we knew we could read between the lines. And the first words out of his mouth, I will never forget. Quote, there's a bias in this town toward war. And then he went on, essentially, and it, it, even John Kerry was sitting beside him looking kind of like, man, I don't believe he's saying all this. But what he was saying, in essence, was he didn't know what to do about it. And in particular, he didn't know what to do about his own staff, his own Democratic Party being a part of this bias toward war. Um, you know, we, we think the Republicans are the only ones who are warmongers, all contraire. Right. Right. <laughs> Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, they can be just as warmongering as anyone else. Look at what they just did with the defense budget. Sure. Biden sends it over far too high. And they plus it up by another $25, $26 billion under Jack Reed, Rhode Island Democrat. And every Democrat except Elizabeth Warren on the Senate Armed Services Committee voted for it. Every Democrat except Elizabeth Warren. Uh, so it's a misnomer to think that the Democrats with regard to the war power are much different than the Republicans. But President Obama was telling us that one of the things that influenced him with regard to Libya and I think Hillary Clinton was very much on this train too, uh, was this business of, this is a humanitarian act. This is Jesus, this is Christ, this is God. This is all the thing, they didn't use those terms right. because they're, they're a little bit more, uh, uh, less evangelized, uh, evangelized yeah. than right. others. Yeah. But I, I think that's, that's what they, it was religious with them that we had to do this. We had to do this. And I think what President Obama was saying, man, I'm sick of that. That, that. That's not what we should be basing national security policy on. How we feel about someone else's atrocities or how we feel about someone, else oppress someone else's oppression of their own people. Because we have, a, we have a prospect as an empire, a very, very real prospect of making the situation worse, of moral injury by what we do. And that's of course, what we did in Libya. It, 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 it was a basket case afterwards. We let the greatest arm ca arms cache in North Africa with over 5,000 shoulder fired missiles in it and countless other weapons and small arms and ammunition and so forth go. And now it's in ISIS's hands, Al Qaeda's hands. The CIA put out $5,000 for anybody, no questions asked, who brings a shoulder-fired missile in. Mm 
because we, we were so frightened of what was going to happen with those shoulder fired missiles. But we didn't put anybody into Libya to police that. We just dropped a few bombs, killed Gaddafi, and Hillary Clinton made probably the most impolitic diplomatic remark ever made in American history. We came, we saw, and he died. Yeah, yeah. How crass was that? Um, and that's it. And to hell with the aftermath. Well, a lot of people are living with that aftermath. Sure. Just a touch on that uh, aspect between uh, the warmongers of the Republicans, because a lot of people of the left think they're the real progressives of politics. And just you touched on Libya. Uh, there was a huge rift in the White House at the same time. It seemed that uh, at first that B Obama uh, and uh, Vice President Biden were opposed to the Libyan invasion. The people who influenced them were the Susan Rice's and Samantha Powers and Hillary Clinton's. Yes. Um, but that wasn't the case with Syria, was it? No. Um, I, and, and let me add that the record that I was told, the archival data that I have, and most of it, I will admit, is firsthand from people who were around the situation, but not firsthand. As an academic, I would say I went and looked at the NSC cable. Uh, I went and looked at the actual transcript of the NSC meeting or whatever. So it's not primary sources. Mm -hmm. It's secondary and tertiary sources. But here's the story I have. Clinton was on Obama's side. She was with him in terms of being opposed to using force in Libya. NATO, UN, you name it. She was opposed to it. And then she went to Libya. Took a trip to Libya. And it was a very narrow trip. It mm. wasn't all over the country. It wasn't out to Cyrenaica. It wasn't, as I'm told, it was only Tripoli and in Barnes. Mm. Then she came back and she was an ardent, passionate flipper. She changed her mind. And she joined Rice and Powers and it was, it was a very staunch advocate for the war. My question of my interlocutors with this regard and of the archives now, but they're not available yet, at least not to the extent I would want them to be. What changed her? What changed her? Did she go over there and get in one man or one woman's or a couple of people's aura? And they suddenly convinced her that this was essential that Gaddafi go, that we reverse the policy that had been in place. You see, I was, I was there when we made a, a really a rapprochement with Omar. Sure. Muammar Gaddafi. Um, we took him to lunch. Tony Blair went and meet, met with him and we met with him and he promised he would not create a nuclear program any further than he already had. He would get rid of his chemical weapons and we were having a pretty decent relationship. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden we reverse all of that. I want to see those archives. I want to see what Hillary's arguments were post her visit to Libya and why she changed her mind and so forth. It'll be part of my research as we go forward and I, as I teach more mm. um, and my students research. But this is a perplexing moment for me. Why did she come back having changed her mind and become really the hand on the balance? Because that's the way I see the decision-making after that. She puts her hand on the scales for war and President Obama makes reluctantly makes his decision to do it. I, I, my next question is a very, um, I think, important question for the people to understand. When Bush won the presidency, we witnessed uh, the White House staff quickly coalesce into two camps. Uh, one called the Bush people, which are mostly personal friends of the president, such as like uh, the top legal counsels like Alberto Gonzalez and Harriet Myers. Then you have a second group called the Cheney people, who are basically... Uh, people from Cheney's earliest stints in the federal government who are deeply versed in Washington level issues, um, such as Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz and Pearl. Did those in the top levels of the White House see this division in the Bush administration? Not early, not early. I think what they saw early was an administration that had been billed by the New York Times to be a dream team, mm. not quite living up to expectations. And a lot of people on every aisle, if you will, at every point in the government at that level were beginning to wonder. And they were beginning to wonder, one, is this because he has no mandate? After all, he wasn't elected. 
he was appointed by the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, is it because he has no mandate? Is it because he really doesn't have a forceful policy? Is it because this team is more uh, divisive than it is cohesive? Those questions were kind of rolling around the quarters of power, if you will, but nothing really very coherent at that time. 9-11 changed everything mm. almost overnight. Overnight, it, it was almost as if Rumsfeld's going outside after the attack on the Pentagon, rolling up his sleeves and being photographed in the debris and the rubble mm. had made him a warrior hero. And suddenly you have magazine headings where sexiest man in America, you know, Rumsfeld and his media appearances were treasured and people just waited for him to come back on and put the press in its mm. place. You know, uh, no, I'm not going to answer that question. Next question, please. Yeah. Um, and then the divisions began to become stark because you had on the one hand, those people who were, as Bush said in the cabinet meeting, this was not an act of terror. This was an act of war and we're going to war. And you had people on the one side of that who thought that was wonderful because they knew, as Madison said so clearly, that war in the hands of the executive is the true nurse of aggrandizement. Mm. It's the true nurse of fascism, if you will, or at least authoritarianism. Mm. And so they thought that was going to give them, and Cheney was at the peak of this, that was going to give them ultimate power. They were going to be able to do anything they wanted to do to anyone they wanted to do it to at any time they wanted to do it. That caused a real rift with the other side, both in the White House, which wanted to maintain some kind of sobriety and sanity mm -hmm. and some kind of let's establish a balance of power that favors freedom. Bush's favorite, you know, policy phrase at the time. They still wanted to pursue that. Condi was in that camp. She rapidly figured out the National Security Advisor that that camp was going to lose because of Cheney and Rumsfeld being the most powerful guerrillas in the room. Mm -hmm. And so she gravitated slowly over to that camp, but never lost sight of her relationship with the president. Because why? Because she wanted to be secretary of state, desperately wanted to be secretary of state. And so she knew if she divorced herself from the president, take Powell's side every now and then, or oppose Cheney and Rumsfeld on issues she knew the president was more apt to go towards them on, then she distanced herself from the president. In other words, if she disciplined the decision-making process, the way a NSA is supposed to do, she'd lose the president and she wouldn't be secretary of state. So she then backs away from it and backs away from it in a sense that anytime it looked like it was going Rumsfeld and Cheney's way, which most often it did, she was gonna be there. That created the huge schism in mm. the government. Mm. They put the 800 pound gorilla Powell on this side and the 800 pound gorillas Rumsfeld and Cheney often with the 500 pound gorilla Condi Rice there and Bush somewhere in the middle. And when Bush, Bush came down on China, for example, with Powell, he came down with Powell. When the EP3 and the Chinese F8 collided April 10th, 2001, and we had an emergency and a crisis, Powell handled that crisis before Rumsfeld and Cheney could even wake up. It was already solved and Bush was on his side. And from that moment on, Powell had the China portfolio, arguably the most important in, in the security foreign policy relationship. But on most other things, Cheney had his way and he had his way as Powell said to me with a metaphor that I'll never forget, came back from a meeting in the White House and he looked at me and he said, you know, Cheney knows how to get Bush to pull out his 45 and start shooting. And I don't know how to get him to holster it. And that, that's what it became. And then the stark divisions began to show up. And then it became a nightmare decision-making team, truly a nightmare. The system was absolutely ignored. The National Security Council system, the statutory decision-making process was ignored. So Condi didn't have to worry about managing a system that didn't exist. Cheney and Rumsfeld made the decisions offline. Cheney went in the Oval, got the president's approval, and then the bureaucracy was told to implement. That's not a very good way to do business because the bureaucracy, when it isn't in on the decision-making, usually says, extended middle finger to you. Sure. <laughs>
and does everything it can to thwart your policy implementation, especially if it disagrees with the policy. My, my final five questions for you are gonna be the most important of this uh, interview. Um, but and the first one would be something that is very, uh, it's not generally known to the American public. In 2002, Paul Wolfowitz and Douglas Fight created the Office of Special Plans. Can you explain for our audience what that unit was about? My best estimate of what it was about, and here there are some primary sources available already. Mm -hmm. um, National Security Archives, for example, at George Washington University. Um, it was a special operation inside the Pentagon set up because Donald Rumsfeld was vulnerable in this regard. He had said repeatedly he didn't trust the CIA and he didn't trust intelligence provided by the CIA. So what do you do? You've got your own DIA, which is the CIA inside, inside the Pentagon, Pentagon yes. um, and tremendous competition there. Some would say that was one of the worst things that ever happened was to set the one up because all you got is competition and it's not a healthy competition. Sure. Um, but he wasn't getting what he wanted. And so Wolfowitz and Fife, Fife at the point of the sword on this, said, we'll get it for you. We'll get it for you. So they set up their own intelligence operation within policy in the Department of Defense. Looked over by Wolfowitz, but principally run and looked over by Douglas Fife. They created their own intelligence. They had a direct line to the vice president and the vice president had a direct line to them. So when the vice president got some information, which he was a sponge about, raw intelligence, not an intelligence professional, didn't know how to interpret it, but he did interpret it and he passed it on to Fife to add to the pile, if you will. And Fife's people went out like sponges and grabbed all they could, and they created an alternative to the CIA's um, intelligence analysis. Now, what happened there, of course, was George Tennant, uh, director of central intelligence slash head of the CIA, he smells this out. He's a political animal. He's not an intelligence expert. And so he says, well, I got two choices. I either start a really bloody confrontation with those boys over in the Pentagon, or I use them as best I can. And he decided on the latter. Well, it's really questionable given the record, who used whom? <laughs> <laughs> but it isn't, it isn't dark at all who used them both, Dick Cheney. Right. So Cheney takes the most warped information that he can get from both, puts it with the warped information he's manufacturing himself, takes much of it and ships it up to the New York Times, who publish it on the front page, right side above the foal. Cheney then gives speeches quoting the New York Times as the accurate source for what Saddam Hussein is doing, for example. <laughs> you can't get any better than this. It, it's just an incredible reflection of Cheney's genius as a bureaucratic entrepreneur. He knew the system. He knew where all the points in the system were, and he used it. And when I say system, I don't mean just inside the government. I mean the New York Times, the media, others like that. He used them all. And he built this picture of Saddam Hussein being a huge threat, having even an active nuclear program, which, of course, he didn't have even a wit of. Um, and he used that to get the president, who I think was really so inexperienced, he didn't know how to challenge Cheney, into a, a situation where he was as feverish and as warmongering about Iraq as he was about Afghanistan. Mm. And that didn't take very much in the wake of 9-11. Right. It, it was almost right after 9-11 that the prospects for a military invasion in Iraq was right yep. at the White House table. You, But, but let me point out, okay. Bush was not willing to divert forces from Afghanistan in the beginning. It took a lot of work by them on him to get him to begin to divert forces as early as November of 2001, when he told Tommy Franks, then the commander of Central Command and responsible for vote, both war theaters, mm -hmm. he told him to start planning for Iraq, which took the eye off the ball in Afghanistan and caused a lot of the problems that would subsequently haunt Afghanistan. Right. And you were, to touch on this more, you, you were an outspoken critic against the war of Iraq. 
what was this? I, I'm I'm certain that Powell was in the same light. The neoconservatives were pushing for this as well, but they needed a good face, and that would be Powell. W would that be fair to say that they used Powell for this? I think when Cheney stuck his finger in his uh, chest, Powell's chest, and said, you can afford to lose a few polling points, he was saying, in essence, go to New York and give this briefing and put your reputation on the line for this war. Mm. And if you aren't, you know, the open parentheses, the unstated, if you aren't willing to do that, leave, close parentheses. Mm. Now, people have said to me, Powell should have resigned at that point. And I've said back to them, you don't understand the United States. You don't understand the American people. You don't understand our power structure. Had Powell left at that point, the press would have played with it for a week, and then Powell would have been forgotten, and we'd gone to war anyway. So what Powell thought, I think, and you know, you'd never get him to talk about this. I couldn't even get him to talk about it. Uh, what he thought was, if I leave, someone will come in here, Condi Rice, who will be even more uh, a part and parcel of the White House and the Defense Department. And there won't even be my reluctance available to the president with regard to this war. And he was particularly concerned about the political aftermath. Uh, like when he told Bush, you're going to, you're basically going to own 27 million people and you got to be prepared to do something. You can't just cut and run. This is a problem that the academics haven't picked up on yet, though. They all jump on either the one side. You know, the Office of Special Plans, Fife, Wolfowitz, Cheney, Rumsfeld, a whole bunch. Or the jump on the other side, Powell, if they're against the war and so forth. What happened was this dream team, after becoming a nightmare team, became a real nightmare. A fundamental, deep, profound nightmare. Mm. You had Powell and Condi actually advocating that the president stay and fulfill his obligations as an occupying power and do all that he could for the Iraqi people. You had Rumsfeld and Cheney saying, no, 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 no. We want to do Syria. We want to do Iran. We want to do other people in the Middle East. And we can't do that if we're stuck in Iraq. So they, you know, that's not what they said, but that's what they were thinking. What they said was, we need to get out. We don't do nation building. We need to get out. So Rumsfeld was talking about, for example, being out of Iraq by August, September at the latest. Um, and, and the president stepped into that and said, no, I'm siding with Powell and Condi. We're staying and we're going to do our occupying power responsibilities. Now, we muck that up majorly, but that's, I don't think, a reflection on Powell's recommendation of the president that he had some responsibilities, nor is it a reflection on Cheney and Rumsfeld wanting to leave early. Maybe that would have worked better. Who knows? We didn't do it. What it is is a reflection on a broken, absolutely broken decision making process. An inexperienced president who couldn't forge something in in the face of that, and a real mess in Iraq because of that. The intelligence coming in for Iraq was was questionable at best. This is what made it so uh, mesmerizing in itself that they uh, the intelligence agents such as the CIA would um, be used as a reputable source for this. And two of the sources were one from the Israeli Intelligence Committee, uh, Mossad, actually said that they saw uh, Mohammed Atta have a meeting in Prague, Atta being one of the ringleaders of September 11th attacks. Um, the CIA's torture of Sheikh Ibn al-Libi, uh, where he confessed to admitting that al-Qaeda and the Ba'athist officials- Yeah, the CIA didn't torture him, the Egyptians did. I'm sorry, the, that's right, the yeah. Egyptians, that's right. And we weren't even there, which is bad tradecraft. To take someone else's, someone else's word when you aren't even there, when the interrogation right, takes place, right. bad trade crap. Why? And all this information was basically fictitious. Um, and then you had to end up reviewing the information from the CIA, which was used to prepare a powerful presentation. Yet, not only did you have not even just a week to review the information embedded, the CIA and influence from the Office of Special Plans changed the outline of what Powell was saying. Can you elaborate more on that? Well, Cheney actually went out to the CIA 11 times. Cheney brought un undue pressure on the CIA. Um, I'm convinced today that he had two analysts at the CIA, and they happened to be the two analysts that George Tenet restricted Powell to. He could only listen to Robert Walpole and Larry Gershwin. Mm -hmm. 
They were the only two analysts uh, tenant allowed to come in front of Powell. Um, and I'm convinced that they were, they had double allegiance. They were working with Cheney, uh, if not for him, in addition to uh, working for George Tenet. Some of the reinforcement for that belief is that uh, here's one of the greatest intelligence failures in the post-World War II era. And what do these people get after this intelligence failure becomes public knowledge? They get promoted and rewarded. So and it's Cheney taking care of his own. Um, it's, and, it, and let me back up for a moment. It's not like this is the first time this has ever happened. When Ronald Reagan wanted his arms build up in the early 80s, he turned to Bill Casey, his CIA director, and he said, essentially, I need an intelligence briefing. Not unlike the October 2002 NIE, National Intelligence Assessment for Iraq. I need one of those. Wasn't called it then, but same thing. Casey then turned around and built a picture of the Soviet Union as being 10 feet tall and growing taller. Well, the analysts in the bowels of the CIA, bowels of the CIA were telling their bosses that the Soviet Union was falling apart. Uh, hey, it did fall apart mm -hmm. <laughs> just a few years right. later. Yeah. They were right. That's right. But Reagan wanted that intelligence assessment for that arms buildup. Casey wanted to satisfy Reagan. So he got a couple of people who were willing to write a different version of the intelligence and they gave it to Reagan and he got his arms built up. The same thing happened with Iraq. There were people in the agencies and in INR state in particular who disagreed with the October 2002 NIE, but they were not allowed voice. They were not allowed to get to the first client Clinton call, or uh, Tenet called the president, the first client. Only Tenet could get with the first client and his deputy, John McLaughlin, who was the Svengali in all this, because John was the intelligence expert mm -hmm. and John lied through his teeth to me at the CIA. Um, for example, on one really, really tough day, about the fifth day of seven that we used to get Powell ready, Powell grabbed me by the stacking swivel, literally, he grabbed me, he'd never done that before. And he put me down in a room inside the National Intelligence Council and he slammed the door and he looked around and he said, we're alone in here, right? And I said, well, it is the CIA, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> he, he, he kind of smiled, but he right. said, he said, I got, I got some real problems with this terrorist business in my spiel. What are your problems? He said, I just, I, I don't like it at all. It's like Deuteronomy in the Bible. It's like Ahab begat Muhammad hmm. begat, you know, whatever. And it doesn't stick together. And he went on in that vein for a second or two. And I looked at him and I, I literally cut him off. And I said, Mr. Secretary, let's throw it out. I don't like it either. I think he was amazed. I think he thought I was going to object. I didn't. I said, let's throw it out. So we went to Lynn Davidson, the speechwriter who was working on the presentation, said, Lynn, take everything on that out. John McLaughlin was leaning against the door. John McGlunka disappeared. My fault, my error. I should have said, where is John going? <laughs> well, we go back in about an hour later, the room that we were using, it was Tenet's briefing room, we were using to prepare Powell. And we're doing some rudimentary rehearsals at that point. And Powell is in the middle of one of these. Tenet gets up and leaves. So I'm sitting to the left of Powell, so I'm looking at George and thinking, what the hell are you doing leaving when we're doing this? And we have so little time to do it. Well, it's about 15 minutes. I'm getting ready to get up and go find out where he went. About 15 minutes, though, he comes back and he sits down and he says to Powell, and this is almost a direct quote. It's still in my ears. We've just learned from interrogation of a high-level Al-Qaeda operative of major contacts between Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda and the Muqa Barat. The Iraqi secret police, mm -hmm. including Al Qaeda's training the Bukharat in how to use chemical and biological weapons. Powell turned to me and said, put it back in LW. And that changed Powell's attitude about that portion, which I think with the American people at least was the most powerful portion of his presentation mm -hmm. because it made them think Al Qaeda and 9-11 and Saddam Hussein were connected. That's right. Um, and George, uh, George Tenet 
to a certain extent, but John McLaughlin, to a major extent, were responsible for that. And I think John, as the intel the 20 plus year intelligence expert, knew that he was given specious information. It wasn't until August that Powell and I found out Sheikh al Libya had been tortured by the Egyptians. Right. No US personnel had been present and he'd recanted. And here's the real yes. kicker. That's right. When he recanted, the DIA put out an immediate burn notice on his testimony. When I asked George Tennant later, why weren't we shown that burn notice? He said it was a computer glitch. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, and Al Libby actually is allegedly supposed to have committed suicide in, in prison. Um, yeah, in a Libyan prison. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, next, my next question is something that involves you as well. Uh, it's the Bush White House mainly Donald Rumsfeld authorized the CIA to conduct enhanced interrogation techniques using the SEER program with Vice President Cheney and deciding that the third Geneva Convention would not apply to any Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda lookalike detainees. You became an outspoken critic of these decisions then and now. Um, what Now, the CIA would later say that they, they got uh, reports and uh, testimony that was important about future projects. Uh, you, but you were one of the very few that were outspoken critics of this. Well, I, I saw all of the top secret and code word information that passed across the Secretary of State's desk. I saw the same thing the president saw on most occasions. I saw no evidence whatsoever of anything the CIA or the military did tactically, operationally, or strategically that led to any positive action. Nothing came from the torture. Here's what I think actually happened, and I, I'm writing something on this, but I think I have enough evidence to actually put a, a, an array of end notes in it and cite principal sources, primary sources. I think Tenet began to do high value detainees immediately. High value detainees were those he was squirreling away in Thailand, Romania, and so yes. forth, and what later became, became called secret prison. Gina Haspel ran one of them. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so Rumsfeld's doing this, and I don't think it was ever more than a dozen. It was those that Bush later used to justify Guantanamo because he got them out of the secret prisons and sent them to Guantanamo. And that became the first time Guantanamo ever held a serious terrorist. Mm -hmm. Think of that for a moment. 700 people down there, no serious ter terrorists down there. And yet we're torturing the crap out of them. Yeah. So that's how it started with Tenet doing a high value detainee program. He came to the president and said, I got to have cover. I'm not going to jail. I've, I've got to have cover. So then they went and got the Justice Department, uh, people like John Yu, to write them a justification of it. And Yu, of course, writes that unbelievably dumbass justification of torture, saying torture is only that which is just short of death, organ failure and death. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you don't go up to that point, you're not torturing. Right. Oh, come on, John. Anyway, this becomes a self-feeding mechanism, if you will, because now Rumsfeld says, wait a minute, the CIA is getting actionable intelligence out of these people and I'm not. So let me write a memo, and I'm really abbreviating here because there's a lot of things that happen, yeah. but Rumsfeld writes this memo that goes through double D, A through Z, A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D <laughs> detailing the things specifically that his people can do the people in Guantanamo and at Bagram and at Abu Ghraib and elsewhere that don't constitute torture. And as Alberto Mora points out, Navy JAG to the general counsel at DOD later when he reads this memo, Bill, Bill Haynes, do you realize if you do all of these things or 10 of these things or five of these things in combination over extended period of time, it is torture? And, and Haynes convinces Alberto that he's going to stop it. He's going to go see Rumsfeld and he's going to stop it. Well, all Haynes was doing was getting rid of Alberto. He didn't do any such thing. It keeps on going and it winds up in Abu Ghraib. So now you've got the military contaminating its own ranks with this bullshit Rumsfeld's put out. And you've got the CIA 
with some special forces from the military contracted to them and the contractors, the contractors that they had anyway, doing it on their own. And it spreads. It spreads from Guantanamo to Bagram in Afghanistan and to Iraq. Jeffrey Miller helps it spread. The, the leader down at Guantanamo who went to visit both places and took his, his rule book with him. Um, this is a true mess, but this is how it spreads like wildfire throughout the ranks of the armed forces and uh, even further in the CIA than the high value detainee program, because everybody says, well, they're doing it and the president approved it right. so we can do it. And it, it becomes, I've really condensed it, but it becomes a, a, a really war crime filled program. It, just a quick follow-up to that. Is it your fear that the Guantanamo five, which is the basically Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi bin al um, the, the ones that are linked to the September 11th attacks because they were tortured mercilessly, that they are basically their confessions are not they're no good. Yeah, they're no good. They're no good. In a court of law, they'd be thrown out. So what you're seeing with the military commissions right now is just that they can't even proceed. Now, the, the few that have been released now, because they probably never did anything other than just be in the wrong place at the wrong time, yeah. um, have been released strictly because we think that they were completely innocent and we shouldn't have had them in the first place, even though we've had some of them for 10 years plus. But the ones we know are guilty, and I don't think they're more than a dozen, a dozen and a half. They're contaminated because of what we did to them. Right. Right. So you bring them to the United States or you leave them there forever. You put them in a maximum security prison and you hope the U.S. court system doesn't intervene. Those are the only choices you have because you're so messed up. Everything from the sequence of evidence to the corruption of the interrogations, the torture and such that you could never try them. Not in a genuine U.S. court. You could never try them. My last question to you is, you once said in a documentary back in 2006, uh, it was an APEC documentary, that if the U.S. invaded Iran, unlike what happened in Iraq, an exodus of generals would walk out of the Pentagon. Do you still hold true to that statement now? And are uh, the odds greater or less for an invasion of Iran? I think I understand your question. Is, is, is there a possibility we might still go to war with Iran? Yes, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think there is. And I don't count Joe Biden as a real break on that. Um, I think what's happening there right now and what has happened up to this point with regard to the JCPOA renegotiations, if you will, is key here. Um, they just elected, you probably know, they just elected one of the most bloodthirsty guys they could have elected. But I think what's happening in Iran is really the IRGC is in charge now. Mm. What we have is a military dictatorship that still looks like a theological republic, but it isn't. It's really a military dictatorship. The IRGC is in charge. I don't know what that means, though, in terms of their policy and how they'll proceed from this point on. You may know that of late, they are having a lot of problems with their own people, partly because of COVID but partly also because their own people are getting disgusted with the ripoff that the IRGC performs every day mm. of millions of dollars from the Iranian economy. We just had a study that shows that probably of, let's say there's $500 billion lying around in terms of half a trillion dollars in terms of the oil program. Um, the IRGC gets about 60% of that. Very little of that makes its way back into healthcare, back into education, back into help for small businesses and so forth. So they're getting tired of that. Um, would we take advantage of that and try to give it a little kick by starting something? Yes, absolutely. Uh, will we do that? I don't know. I think it's important. Monday, President Biden is meeting with the Iraqi prime minister. They're allegedly going to talk about the virus and about uh, other things that are impact the oil program and so forth. But they're also going to talk about the status of forces agreement and all U.S. forces coming out of Iraq. I think the prime minister is going to ask for all forces to come out. He's caught between a rock and a hard place. Hmm. Um, will the Iranian militias in Iraq then leave? That's anybody's guess. They won't have the United States to fight anymore inside Iraq. And what good does it do Iran to destabilize Iraq? What Iran needs is for Iraq to be a good, viable trading partner. Mm 
What, what, what Iran needs is for Iraq to intervene in Washington on its behalf. Um, you need all these things to get the region stable and prosperous again. Um, so I don't think the Iranians will stay there if we leave, but will we leave? Will Biden be smart enough to say, okay, I agree with you. Your hold on Iraq is untenable as long as we're there. Those Iranian militias are not gonna leave until we leave. We're their real target. So we'll leave. So this is gonna be an important meeting on Monday. Um, and, and, and let's see what follows that. Do we leave? And we're gonna leave Syria too if we do that. I don't think so. I think the president's, you know, one of the greatest mistakes empires make is reinforcing failure. Well, we failed all over the Middle East. We have failed miserably. What do you do when you fail? You either cut and run and count your losses yes. or you reinforce.